democracy is something that is uh, tenuous and fragile, right? It's an ecosystem that can be disrupted very easily. We have an authoritarian threat to our democracy. That threat is largely being cultivated by Christian nationalists. And therefore, the 2024 elections will decide the direction of this country for generations. Well, wonderful to be with you all, and thanks to uh, everyone who helped make this happen. I want to say special thanks to Rod for uh, the invitation and for reaching out to me, and uh, just uh, so excited to have a chance to to visit y'all. I wish I was there in person, wish I was there and could visit and go to brunch and see the lake and hang out, but nonetheless, we'll do, we'll do with this. Uh, I want to talk today about Christian nationalism and its threat to democracy. Uh, and I want to do that by by first starting um, with a, a clip. And I know you're you're probably not going to be able to hear this, but there are going to be captions. And so, do your best to read the captions. And if you if you if you can't read the captions, it's going too fast. Don't worry. I'm going to paraphrase here in a minute. Okay. So, um, I'm going to flip on over and uh, show you this. Here we go. Can everyone hear? Yeah. yeah. All right. We're all good. Okay. Great. So this is at a Trump rally. Uh, not excuse me. This is not at a Trump rally. This is uh, be right before the Iowa caucuses. So, uh, you're uh, you know just to the south of you there, um, in Iowa before the caucuses, and we have somebody asking, would you rather have four more years of Joe Biden, or Donald Trump as a dictator, not as a president, as a dictator, just a, a full blown dictator. Yeah. I heard him that said that was going to be a big day that was the first day. And I thought to myself, you know, why did the world stay up? All right. There's a lot happening there. Uh, I, I hope you could follow along at least a little bit with those captions. So the, the question is, would you rather have Joe Biden as president or Donald Trump as dictator for four more years? And the answers from the first two gentlemen in that video are, we'd rather have Donald Trump as a dictator. Uh, and and that, I, I just, there's a lot going on. One of the you know things I want to point out here is it's not Donald Trump as a president. It's somebody who's taken non-democratic control of the country with no Congress, no judicial branch, none of those things. Um, now, what I want to put forth, and I'll, I'll jump in here to uh, my presentation, is that um, we've reached a point in the country where uh, this is not something that is uh, a sentiment people are hiding behind anymore. And one of the hypotheses, uh, hypotheses that I would like to put forth is that we're at a place where uh, not only where democracy is not a sacred value to many, but uh, at which many Americans are ready to express that fact proudly in public. I would call this an authoritarian threat to American democracy. The idea that democracy is not the goal, and in fact, democracy might be a problem. Now, what I would add to this hypothesis is that Christian nationalism is a driving force of this threat. And so, uh, we have an, an authoritarian threat to, to our democracy. That threat is largely being cultivated by Christian nationalists. And therefore, the 2024 elections will decide the direction of this country for generations. 
And I'll talk more about that in a second. Let me uh, jump in here to the to the um, next slide, and we'll go from there. So, what is Christian nationalism? Uh, I think Christian nationalism has three foundational components, and and I'm going to be brief on these. Happy to talk more about these in the in the question and answer period, and and really slow down. But there's a myth of a Christian nation. There's nostalgia for past glory, and there's an apocalyptic view of the nation's future. So a lot of times you'll hear people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was just quoted. Uh, we can't seem to get away from the Georgia Congresswoman. Uh, she is everywhere. You'll hear people say, well, being Christian nationalist is just about being a Christian who loves their country. I don't know what's wrong with that. And it's really not. Uh, and I've said this many times on my show, I say it in my book, that the ways that uh, we identify Christian nationalists are by asking folks questions on surveys and, and in other forms. And so some of the questions that are often asked to people are, are things like this. Should the federal government declare the United States a Christian nation? Should the government send out a, uh, a memo, institute a policy, declare to the world, this is a Christian nation? And people say, yes, they should. People are asked, do you need to be a Christian to be a real American? And people say, yes. So now we've gone from, hey, I'm a Christian who loves my country, to I'm a Christian and this is my country. And everyone else is a second-class citizen. Everyone else is not a real American like me because they're not a Christian. There's a big difference between practicing my religion freely and loving my country and saying that the practice of my religion is the condition for loving my country. It's a big difference to those two things. So there's this myth that this is a Christian nation. Uh, this myth maintains that the country was built for and by Christians. Now, don't get me wrong. I get asked this a lot uh, by my students, by a lot of other people. Well, weren't there a lot of Christians who were involved in founding the United States? And my answer is, of course, of course there were. Now, to say that this is just a Christian nation, however, is a different mm -hmm. matter. Uh, to lump the uh, religion of Thomas Jefferson, who has his own Jefferson Bible, where he took out all the miracles, with that of James Madison, with that of George Washington, with that of uh, on down the line, all the way back to Roger Williams and Cotton Mather, uh, it really makes no sense. There was a lot of people involved in the founding of the United States. Some of them were Christians. Some of them were Christians in ways that look like evangelicals or Orthodox Christians today. Others would have been labeled heretics. Others would have been probably more uh, accurately categorized as agnostic. The point is this. This is not a Christian nation in the sense that it was built for Christians. This is not a Christian nation in, in the sense that in order to be an American, you must practice one religion, one type of Christianity. So uh, one of the ideas that I, I really want to uh, put forth here, too, is that a lot of folks will say these things, and some of the some of the men you saw in that video might be some of them, well, this is a Christian nation, and uh, we were founded on Ju Judeo-Christian values, and if we don't get back to those, the world will, is going to hell because Marjorie Taylor Greene says there's earthquakes, and that means obviously the end, end time is coming is, along with Jewish space lasers and everything else she talks about, right? So a lot of these folks actually may not go to church or read the Bible regularly, and you're thinking, well, how does that make sense? And it makes sense because for a lot of folks, Christian nationalism is a cultural identity. It's a story they tell about themselves and their country. It's a role they get to play. I just said that Christian nationalism is a way for people to think of themselves as the real Americans, the true patriots. So if I want to play the role of true patriot and real American, then I'm going to start, and I start telling a story that says, well, you have to be a Christian to do that. And this, this country was founded on God's, God's principles. Well, then I'm going to say, yeah, of course, I'm with, I'm with that. That's great. Now, do I go to church? No. Do I go to Bible study three times a week? Not really. Have I cracked the Bible uh, in a couple of years now? No. Uh, when is the last time I prayed? Couldn't tell you. But Christian country, right? Because it's a story you tell. It's a story you tell about yourself and your country, and it's a role you get to play uh, rather than a measurement of your religious practices uh, on a weekly basis. Now, this nostalgia that I that is part of Christian nationalism is the idea that the country has declined over time due, the, due to the growing prominence of outside invaders and ungodly forces. The idea is this used to be a city on a hill. 
but it's gone downhill because too many people have uh, got in the way. They've gotten into the city, you know, people who were not supposed to be here. People like immigrants, people like people of color, women who want to be in charge, women who want control of their bodies. Now we should probably build a wall to keep all those people out of the city on a hill. That's what Jesus would want, probably. Uh, and so uh, let's do that. The idea is that things are getting worse. In 2016, 70% of white evangelicals told Public Religion Research Institute that they believe the country has changed for the worse since the 1950s. So when you ask folks, hey, when was the country great? And they tell you the 1950s. Uh, here's what I'm hearing. And I know this is, uh, we could talk for three hours about this, but the 1950s are a time before the civil rights movement, before uh, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, before immigration reform, before the feminine mystique was published, before Stonewall happened, before the Loving case, the Supreme Court that ensured mixed race couples could get married, a guy like me who's got a white mom and a Japanese American dad, uh, make sure that they could get married in every uh, state across the country. We could go on and on about the 1960s and what happened uh, there. Good, bad, ugly, and so on. However, if you say, I want to go back to a time before Jim Crow was abolished, uh, I, to me, you're telling me what kind of country you want. You're saying to be a Christian is to be a real American. To be a white Christian, in fact, is to be the, the, the real American. And everyone else needs to see their place as a second-class citizen. You might be gay. You might be a woman who doesn't want to be married to a patriarchal man. You might be somebody who whose family has a recent immigration story. You might be brown. You might be black. You might be Asian. And you know... You just need to realize you don't have to leave. Just you're just you're you sit in the back. You be quiet. We will lead this place. Uh, things things got really bad from the 1950s to say, I don't know, in 2008 when we had the first black president. More on that in a second. So here's a quote. This is from Timothy Goglin, who's uh, an executive at Focus on the Family, was in the, the George W. Bush administration. We have to remember it's not just the Judeo-Christian tradition where the country was founded, but in the social and the moral revolution of the 60s and 70s. In his view, the 60s were a frontal assault on the Beatitudes, on the Ten Commandments, on the whole body of ethics that forms the Judeo-Christian foundation of the United States of America. You hear this a lot. You can hear this from Charlie Kirk. You can hear this from uh, any number of pastors and uh, talking heads weekly. Uh, I'm going to skip this for time, but basically this is where we get the idea of family values, and I'm very happy to talk about family values at length. Uh, family values to me is a code word. It's a code word for a certain kind of family and a certain kind of country. Uh, now, we have reached a place, if you don't believe me, <laughs> if you don't believe that what I'm saying is is actually happening where people think the 1950s would be better. Well, the, here's Charlie Kirk, who I just mentioned. Charlie Kirk's the head of TPUSA. I think many of you have probably heard of him. I hope so. Um, TPUSA is one of the most influential right-wing organizations in the country. Charlie Kirk's in his 30s. So this organization is incredibly influential with people who are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, and uh, they are making concerted efforts to be on college campuses. They have thousands of chapters there. They're also making concerted efforts to reach pastors. Um, he says uh, over uh, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday back in January, the deification of MLK and his proto-DEI ideology marks the exact moment that the progress of Black America goes sideways. Their cities disintegrate. Their families collapse. Educational progress stagnates. They become enormously dependent on government support. Crime explodes, and so on and so on and so on. He says in another place, MLK was a bad guy. What have I talked about today so far? <laughs> we need a dictator. And we've really gone from a place where instead of quoting Martin Luther King Jr. Day, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. on Martin Luther King Jr. Day in order to justify some sort of right wing talking point. Hey, Martin Luther King Jr. would have wanted us to build a wall. That's why we celebrate. Right. We've gotten so far in the country that one of the most influential right wing uh, uh, figures is saying he was a bad person. He was bad for the country. You, you could not have openly said that in 2005 or 2008. You, you, you could, George W. Bush, right? And I have known, uh, you know, this is me personally, I have no nostalgia for George W. Bush, but he would, he could not have said this. Nobody close to him could have said this. 
But in 2024, you can say this and you will gain your pop in popularity rather than lose. So we've reached a place where this nostalgia, right? Here's the point I'm trying to make. The nostalgia for the 50s, the nostalgia for when America was great is being expressed. And no code words, just straight up. I want a time before Martin Luther King Jr. Now, the final def uh, trait of Christian nationalism is its apocalyptic tone. The evangelical emphasis on the end of the world is transposed into a crisis narrative that envisions the country as on the precipice of a catastrophic decline. If real Americans don't take decisive action, the story goes, they will not simply lose their majority. The country as they know it will be gone forever. So the view of the past is that we used to be great and we are now no longer. We're, we're the, the view of the present is we need a dictator. And why do we need a dictator? Because uh, we are facing the end of the world. We're facing the end of America. We're facing an apocalypse because Joe Biden is demonic, uh, because the Democrats are from Satan, and everyone who poses uh, Donald Trump and the MAGA movement and Christian nationalism are trying to ruin everything. The thing that I'd like to, to say about uh, apocalypse is this. If you can convince people that we are in an, an apocalypse, you can justify extreme action. I uh, live in California. We have earthquakes here, and I have two little kids. I have a six-month-old who's sleeping in the room next to me, and I have a two-and-a-half-year-old. And, if you know, I want to, on a Saturday like yesterday, go to – take those two kids to target tell my wife hey you stay here and take an hour off i'm gonna, i'm taking these two to target do you know how long it takes me to get out of the house with those two children <laughs> right like do, it is not like oh i got my keys and my phone and my wallet let's go to target it is like we got diapers we got extra clothes we've got milk for the baby we've got uh wipes we've got uh, the car seats are all set. We get everybody strapped in. I look down. I'm not wearing a shirt for some reason. I got to go back in the side and how, right? It's like 48 minutes just to get to Target, which is 10 minutes away, right? Because you know what? When you have kids, that's how you got to do it. You got to make sure there's extra clothes and extra milk and water and snacks and the whole thing. If there's an earthquake, I just grab the kids and we get under the table. We run out of the house. One or the other, right? You know why? Because when you're in an apocalypse... Normal doesn't cut it. Thinking ahead, best practices, respect for uh, a day-to-day -day routine, who cares? We got to act now. If I convince you we are in apocalypse, you will do extreme things and you will go along with extreme measures. So I'm going to tell you over and over and over and over again, the world is ending. Joe Biden is going to ruin America. If you elect this person as your mayor, as your governor, you won't have a country anymore. Your kids will be eaten. Your children will go hungry. They won't have a school anymore. They're gonna be taken away by the state. Whatever it may be, I'm gonna use any rhetoric possible to convince you we are in a catastrophe and therefore do extreme things, take extreme measures. That leads us here. For these folks, restoring America doesn't mean restoring democracy. It might just mean the opposite. Democracy is not a sacred value in this equation. It is not the goal. The goal is power. The goal is to colonize Earth for God. I uh, wrote a piece with a, with a colleague recently on Mike Johnson and the appeal to heaven flag he flies outside of his office. And one of the, the phrases my colleague Matt Taylor used is that folks who, who have the theology of Mike Johnson want to colonize Earth for God. They want dominion. They want conquest of every aspect of human society. So if democracy becomes a problem rather than a solution, then democracy will be put aside. Because the sacred value is not sharing power in a democracy where we all have a voice. The sacred value is we are in control as God's delegates on earth, and we get to dictate how society works. Now, I showed you a clip of, of folks saying this country needs a dictator. And I know what some of you might be thinking. Hey, that's great. The, you know, you, you stuck a mic in front of somebody in rural Iowa or uh, somewhere before the Iowa caucus. Uh, do they really speak for some of uh, the, the country? Do they speak for a majority of these? I mean, come on. Maybe it's just a guy on the street, right? I mean, 
maybe this is just somebody who's really into Trump and they're willing to say dictator and it gets lots of views on YouTube and that's great for everybody. Okay, wonderful. Well, what I would say is that the idea that we need a dictator has been cultivated by intellectuals and theologians and historians and pastors and pundits, many of whom are Christian nationalists and for whom democracy is a problem and not a solution. So let me prove it to you. Here is Kevin Slack. Kevin Slack teaches at Hillsdale College. Some of you, uh, it's not not it's in your your neighborhood there uh, of the country, your region, Hillsdale College, and it's a conservative Christian place. He uh, says this: at some point in the decline of every empire, it finally dawns in a truly great leader, one born of the family of the lion or the tribe of the eagle. I, full disclosure: I have no idea what that means. Okay, so. <laughs> I don't know if any of you introduce yourself today like, hi, I'm Rod from the family of the lion. I don't usually do that, but you know, uh, whatever Kevin wants to do, he can do. Hey, I could run this thing. The new right now often discussed as a red Caesar, by which it means a leader whose post-constitutional rule will restore the strength of his people. This is a political scientist at a Christian college openly saying, I kind of wonder if a red Caesar would be helpful. Like if we had a Caesar, a guy who just took control of the Republic. Would that be better? I mean, I we need someone to rescue us, right? We are in a catastrophe. Wouldn't a dictator, I mean, a benevolent good dictator, the good kind, the good kind, wouldn't that be better than democracy? I'm not talking about the bad kind of dictator. I'm just saying the good kind. If we had the good kind, that might be great, right? Here's Michael Anton. Michael Anton is from the Claremont Institute. Claremont Institute should be familiar to you. John Eastman, the now disbarred lawyer who helped con uh, construct the plan to overturn the 2020 election, is also from the Claremont Institute. They are kind of the right wing uh, intellectual think tank of Christian nationalism in the country. Uh, Michael Anton wrote an essay called The Flight 93 Election, where he basically said that if we don't uh, elect Donald Trump in 2016, there, it's like Flight 90. There, there has to be action because otherwise the country is going to go downhill. He says, we may define Caesarism, therefore, as authoritarian one-man rule, partially legitimized by necessity. That necessity is the breakdown of Republican constitutional rule, or if you want to put it bluntly, the corruption of the people. A nation no longer capable of ruling itself must yet be ruled. The benefits of Caesarism are obvious to a nation, perhaps, or to Caesar, obvious to a nation and less so. But some who see certain features of Caesarism as advantageous might therefore conclude that their best option is to work towards such a problematic regime. Those features thus deserve a cursory review. So he does go on in his book to review whether or not Caesarism is a good idea. And he's not, he, he sort of inches up to it and says, yeah, it's not the best idea. I don't love it. It's not ideal. But I could see us needing it. It might, it, we could get to a place where this is what we would need. It's a necessity. Why? Because the corruption of the people means they need to be ruled. They can no longer rule themselves. Well, who decides that? Who gets to say when we can't rule ourselves? And when is that, when is that ever the case? Who gets to make that decision? Well, let's go here to Patrick Deneen, philosopher at Notre Dame University over in Indiana. Today's widespread yearning for a strong leader, one with the will to take back popular control over liberalism's forms of bureaucratized government and globalized economy, comes after decades of liberal dismantling of cultural norms and political habits essential to self-governance. Again, what are they saying to you? We're in such a crisis, and you, the people, are so incapable of taking care of your own house that we need to come take your house over. I'm sorry, we just have to. You're just such children, corrupted sad uh, uh, individuals, and the, the United States is such a place of, of shambles that we're just going to need to come and take over, I'm sorry, a strong leader with the will to take back popular control. Here is Doug Wilson over in Idaho. Uh, I, some of you might be familiar with Doug Wilson. Doug Wilson is a Christian supremacist who believes Christians should be in charge of government. He justified slavery and says in one of his books that there's never been better race relations than in times of slavery in this country. Uh, he thinks that uh, 
he believes in a thoroughly patriarchal family and church. He believes that children as young as two should be beaten if they disobey, and so on. Wilson has repeatedly disavowed any interest in national electoral politics, but Christchurch's eventual aim, Christchurch is his college and uh, his church over in Idaho, is what Wilson explicitly describes in a 2016 book as theocracy, or a network of nations bound together by a formal acknowledgement of the lordship of Jesus Christ. These beliefs have led Christchurch into conflicts with local government, but additionally, Wilson and other Christchurch members have founded a range of local and national institutions which are affiliated or with or sponsored by the church. So Doug Wilson is openly saying we want a network of nations bound together by a formal acknowledgement of the lordship of Jesus Christ. Doug Wilson, you might think, oh, pastor in Idaho, who cares? Well, he has five best-selling books. He is a popular podcaster, uh, very big on YouTube. My guess is that on a on a weekly basis, two million people listen to, to Doug Wilson. This is not somebody in Idaho who has a church of 75 folks and is sort of saying crazy things. This is somebody for uh, uh, millions of people listen to every week. Okay. Then there's Stephen Wolf, who's this book, the case the case for Christian nationalism, was published by Doug Wilson's publishing house. So the connection is is direct. Here's what he says in the book. This he, he argues, Stephen Wolf, for a Christian prince. He thinks that we should have a Christian prince ruling the nation. That's what that's his ideal. This divine presence in the prince speaks to his role beyond civil administration. Through him, as the mediator of divine rule, the prince brings God near to the people. The prince is sort of a national god, not in the sense of being divine or in a materially transcending common humanity, or as an object of prayer or spiritual worship. Hey, we're not going to worship this guy. But as the mediator of divine rule for this nation, as one with divinely granted power to, rec to direct them in their national completeness. So the prince is the mediator of the divine, and he has been granted power by God to direct national completeness. Does this not sound like everything the American Revolution was trying to get away from? I, I don't know. Anybody? He embodies the people as one who, by divine power, executes their will for themselves. He is a master in the master's universe. Once again, you're thinking, well, obscure book by, by obscure guy. Well, when this book came out on Amazon, it was in the top 100 on Amazon's book list, meaning uh, of the 15 million books or so on Amazon, it was in the top 100. It's still a uh, very popular a lot of seminar, seminary students and pastors reading this right now as we speak. It gets worse somehow, Stephen. I don't know. It got it gets worse than a Christian prince. Um, you're not going to be able to hear what he says here, so I'm going to um, go ahead and read my slide, and I'll paraphrase. In his mind, nations can only be founded on a shared ethnicity because your kin have belonged to this people, on this land, to this nation, in this place, and so they bind you to that people in place, creating a common Volkgeist. Wolf's argument for nationalism based on the shared ethnicity of a Volk based in blood relations comes into focus when he explains his intended reader. I am male and I'm rooted ancestrally in Western Europe and I'm speaking largely to a Western European male audience, i.e. I'm speaking to white men. And white men, you should think of this nation as a place your kin have belonged on this land or this nation. And so they, you are bound together as a Volk. What Wolf argues in his book, if you read it, is that, yes, God commands us to love everybody, but he commands us to love those who are most like us the most. Let me say that again. You should love the people most like you the most. Meaning as, he says here, a white male, I should love white people more than anyone else. I should love white Christians more than anyone else. In fact, I should work to create a Christian nation with those people. And yes, there are others out there but they can take care of themselves, okay? I don't know about you, and I could spend, I've read his book, unfortunately for me, I have read his book. Um, and, I, you know, you read these books and you think, why did I choose this career? This is a weird, I could be, you know, I could be, gar I could be a forest ranger walking right now, in the, but I'm not, I'm here reading this book. Um, and he basically argues that, uh, we should have Vulcan homeland as the basis for Christian ethics. I don't know about you. When I hear Vulcan homeland, positive yeah. vibes don't go through my body. I don't know. I think of Nazi Germany. 
I think of people using the idea of a Volk and blood relations to justify why they need to create a nation of, uh, of, of their people only, justifying violence against others. Stephen uh, Wolf, if he had his way, would like to put people who don't go to church on Sunday in jail. He'd like to put you in jail if you uh, curse God's name, uh, and so on and so forth. Once again, popular book, top 100 on Amazon. Now, all of this explains why white Christian nationalists admire Orban and Putin. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this today, but basically we do have a situation, and I think many of you have picked up on it, where uh, a lot of uh, fascination with and admiration for uh, these two strongman leaders. Well, why? Well, because they're the real-life manifestations of the Christian prince or the Red Caesar. Think about it, y'all. They're the benevolent representative God, the divine autocrat. They protect the family. They are always talking about, I mean, listen to Putin and Orban, always talking about family values. There's only man and there's only woman. They will do everything they can to ban gay people and queer people from, from their countries. Anti-immigrant, strongly. They keep in line all the bodies all the fleshly and political bodies in their countries. There's no fluidity. There's no confusion. There's no slippage. They just, they hold it all in place. They get rid of foreign agents and queer elements. They criminalize difference. They mandate binaries and certainty. This is what Christian nationalists want. Once again, if you don't believe me, this is Lauren Vitska on the right, uh, the, the blonde woman speaking to this gentleman. And uh, Lauren Vitska was the candidate for Senate, the United States Senate from Delaware in 2020. And she, in this video, once again, you won't be able to hear it. Uh, she says, I identify with Putin more than Biden because I am a Christian nationalist and Vladimir Putin protects his country in ways that Joe Biden does not. She says in another video, I wish Joe, uh, Vladimir Putin would invade the United States and free us from this regime. Now, this is a person who was up, who was the GOP nominee for Senate. The United, this is not like a rural or or unpopulated corner of Delaware where she wanted to be the state senator, right? One of those elections where like, you know, she wins 180 to 204, right? That's no. United States Senate. Now she lost. Okay, great. Oh, you're thinking no big deal. She lost. But one of our two political parties Put in place somebody for the United States Senate who said, I wish Vladimir Putin would invade this country and free us from the globalist woke uh, regime of Joe Biden. There's a lot of folks who, who go down this road. I'm going to I'm going to go through this because I want to save time for questions and make sure we end on time. But I'm happy to talk about this part of Christian mm -hmm. nationalism in the United States at length. Here's some stats from my colleague at Denison University in Ohio, Paul Joop. Here's what Paul Joop found when he did a, a recent study. 9% of Americans want only Christians to be citizens. So like one out of 10 people in the country are like, you know, only Christians should be citizens. 14% think that their church should have a veto on the government's laws. So 15, you know, 14, 15% are like, yeah, I mean, when the country makes a law, the church should be able to say yay or nay, yes or no. A lot of this traces to belief in modern day prophets. I can talk more about that in a minute, but nonetheless, 9%, 14%, uh, to me, this is pretty scary. Uh, this is uh, a poll from a couple months ago, uh, for actually from last summer, and it says, when people tell you things who do you think, who do you feel like is telling you the truth? Okay. So if you ask Trump voters this, 71% say Donald Trump. So if I vote for Trump, 71% are like, when Donald Trump says a thing, he's right, he's telling the truth. Friends and family, less. <laughs> Conservative media figures, less. Religious leaders, less. Right? That whole idea of a dictator. Well, if you're going to have a dictator, you have to put ultimate faith in that person and that is what we see with people who vote for Donald Trump. Uh, this is something that happened recently, and I just want to highlight it, right? Here's Adolf Hitler on the left. All great cultures of the past perished only because the originally creative race died out from blood poisoning. Adolf Hitler was many things. One of them was a dictator. Immigrants are poisoning the blood of our nation, Donald Trump. 
the person who a lot of people want to be their dictator and who has joked about being a dictator. What does this mean for 2024? Give me five more minutes here and we'll go to questions, I promise. Then it's going to be a really cheery brunch. You're going to go and laugh and <laughs> let loose, okay? Don't worry. Five more minutes of this and then it's brunch time. You're going to get a mimosa or a, a beer and hang out and it's going to be great. Okay. <laughs> They've already told us what is going to happen if Trump is reelected. Project 2025. So some of you are familiar, some of you are not. You should look this up if you're not. But here it's about a thousand pages. But folks from the Heritage Foundation, from Liberty University, Hillsdale College, Turning Point USA and Charlie Kirk and many others have, have signed on to this and are sponsors. They want to put the FCC, the FTC, and Justice Department under exec executive control, meaning the president controls the Justice Department. It is his personal uh, law enforcement agency. He directs them. There's no separation. Put federal workers on Schedule F. What that means is, is that if you're a federal worker, and there are we're talking about tens of thousands of people, you can be put on a, a, a Schedule F, meaning you can be fired at will. Right now, there's a lengthy process. But essentially, if this happens, anybody in the State Department, anybody in the Education Department, any, anyone anywhere can be fired if they are not loyal to Trump, if they post the wrong thing on social media, or more importantly, if they don't go along with something he wants them to do. In the first Trump presidency, there was a lot of folks who just said, what you're asking us to do is illegal. I'm not going to do that. We don't do that here. It's against the law. This is saying, if you stand up and say that, you're fired. We'll get someone to do your job. Thank you very much. Okay, they will say yes. Now we're on track. Could be justice, could be state, could be defense, could be education, could be any number of things. Gut the EPA, dismantle the FBI, break up the Department of Homeland Security, eliminate the Departments of Education and Commerce. Oh, and presidential immunity. So this is from... Uh, uh, just a, about a month and a half ago. You're saying a president could sell pardons, could sell military secrets, could order CTL, SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival. This is a judge asking Trump's uh, lawyers. He would have to be and would speedily be impeached and convicted before the criminal prosecution. One of the arguments Trump is making in his legal cases is that a president has immunity uh, when he is in office or she is in office, meaning whatever they do, they can only be punished or held account if they are impeached and convicted before criminal prosecution. So if you say, as president, if right now, under this theory, Joe Biden said to anybody, SEAL Team 6 or anyone else in our military or in justice or, or anywhere else said, please assassinate uh, my political rival. And everyone knew he did it. He said it on TV. He could only be punished by impeachment, right? If we got that very high bar in the Senate to impeach, that's the only way. That sounds like a dictator to me. That sounds like on the road to somebody who cannot be held accountable, somebody who will act with impunity, somebody who is trying to gut all of the, uh, the, the institutions, the processes that hold uh, uh, the balances of power and checks and balances in our government in place and wants to say, I want to dictate how the country runs and operates. The drift into authoritarianism doesn't always set off alarm bells. Citizens are often slow to realize that their democracy is being dismantled, even as it happens before their eyes. This is from a book called How Democracies Die. My, <clears throat> excuse me, my takeaways for today. This election will shape the USA for a generation or longer. Um, we unfortunately are in for a, a kind of, I think, tumultuous couple of months here. Um, if Trump loses, I think we're going to see more uh, big lie and more violence from people who think that there's no way he could have lost and who want him to be a dictator. If he wins, everything I just talked about, I think, will go into place. If he goes to jail, I have no idea what will happen, but it won't be good. Regardless, this is going to be one of the most decisive elections in our history because uh, it, it will determine uh, how the country looks for a long, long time. Um, I'm not going to vote third party. And I know some of you in the in the room are, are and I know Michigan, there's a, there's a strong 
um, uncommitted uh, movement. I completely understand it. And I'm not here to, to say anything bad about that. I'm also not here to say anything bad about anybody who is frustrated with Joe Biden or anyone else in the Democratic Party. I get it. I'm on board. If I were there with you, I'd love to get coffee and have a three hour talk about all that because I'm largely with you. I'm not going to vote third party because um, as as much as there are frustrations and things even beyond frustrations with the current administration on my part, um, I have a clear view of what will happen if Donald Trump is elected. I, I feel very strongly about um, what he is planning and what the people behind him are planning. When he was in office before, there was a lot of uh, lackeys and bozos in place that did not get a lot done that they could have. There was a lot of Jared, Jared Kushner had like 78 or 85 jobs or something in the last administration. Uh, there was a Scaramucci. You all remember Scaramucci, some of you, right? <laughs> They're not doing that this time. There's a lot of folks already putting in place the handbooks to hand Trump that he can he can just get going from day one. I'm not refusing to lock arms with anyone who is pro-democracy. So I know uh, for me, I, I speak to a lot of humanist groups and atheist groups, secular groups, and um, I love doing that. And um, it's really important to me. Um, and I love the fact that um, there are so many of us secular people who are now organizing in community. If there are Christians, if there are Muslims, if there are Jews, if there are others in my community who are fighting for democracy, I'm not going to refuse to lock arms with them because they're religious people. Um, I think that's a mistake. Finally, I'm going to find one way to be involved. Um, you might be thinking, well, I already do some things or, you know, my district doesn't vote that way or Michigan is sort of this, you know. Uh, this place in the Midwest or the upper Midwest, the, the Great Lakes, et cetera, that is a lot different than Ohio. It's a lot different than than some of our neighbors, Iowa and so on. Um, I would say, well, what else can you do? Is there one thing, right? It's it's April. we got about seven months until this election. Um, are there folks that want to get involved in letter writing campaigns? Can you write five letters a, a, a week? Can you call voters in other districts or work on that behalf of candidates um, in other places. Um, I gave a talk over at, in the Twin Cities uh, a while back and there was folks saying, well, you know, I, I live about 15 minutes from Wisconsin and people from Wisconsin can't drive very well, but nonetheless, I'm gonna help them out uh, by making some phone calls and working on the behalf of some candidates over there in districts that really could uh, go one way or the other. Um, wh what's the one thing you wanna do? Uh, I, I get it, you're busy. There's a lot going on in life. Um, it's not easy to find extra hours in the week. I'm totally uh, with somebody who has two kids and barely has time to shower at, at this point in his life. I get it. But I'm going to say, what's one thing that you can do right now because of the situation we're in? And I'll challenge you to think about that, maybe challenge you to think about that at a brunch or at lunchtime today. Um, but that would be my encouragement and one of the takeaways I'd have. Uh, thanks for listening. Sorry for such a gloomy presentation. I'm a lot more fun at parties than you might expect, but um, nonetheless, appreciate the invitation and happy to talk more here as we uh, do questions and answers and stuff like that. So it seems to me that suppose there were 2% more of the American public who supported Trump, then the problem would be democracy. And the problem is that if you have a bunch of ill-informed people, and the the worst vote, the worst, most ill-informed, most malicious vote cancels out the, the most informed vote. That that kind of system, you would not let your medical plan be created on that basis. You wouldn't want to be represented in a court by by most of these people. That they, it's odd to have all these requirements for making important decisions, but then have um, a democracy. So, so I don't understand um, how democracy can be defended because it's the very thing that can end democracy and, and put a dictator in place. The second question is, I've never heard this phrase Christian Prince before, um, but the, the first person who came to mind was not Donald Trump. So there's a question, well, I can see maybe Mitt Romney, you know, under poor lighting as a Christian prince, but not, Trump just seems like a deplorable choice. Even if I agree with every single policy, 
he would not be the one because he's such a bad human being to to represent my views. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Great questions there. So I'll just start with the first one. Um, I think you point out something that a lot of political theorists have noticed for a long time, and that is uh, democracy has an autoimmune problem. Um, democracy uh, is a system that can uh, turn on itself, right, in an autoimmune kind of way. And I think we see that uh, in this country. I think we see that uh, also in, in, in Orban's Hungary. If you ask Orban, hey, wh why are you a dictator? He's like, I'm not a dictator. I got elected. What do you, what, you, you hate democracy now? Okay. So democracy is something that is uh, tenuous and fragile, right? It's an ecosystem that can be disrupted very easily. And one of the ways that I think you hinted at is through an uninformed electorate or a misinformed electorate, right? Folks who have been sort of primed by way of misinformation or ignorance to vote in certain ways. And that is true of this country. We do have an ecosystem by way of the media that is uh, doing just that. Um, now, you, the, the next question you, some of you might be thinking is, well, why democracy then? I, I understand what you mean there. If there is so much at stake, why would we uh, operate on this basis? My response would be as somebody uh, who, uh, you know, spent a lot of time studying religious wars, who spent a lot of time studying dictatorships and authoritarian figures is this. Um, this system is not perfect democracy. It is scary and it often feels burdensome and slow. Like there's so many processes. What human history has taught me is that when we experiment with giving power to the few or to one, we end up with uh, a lot of, a lot of violence. We end up with a lot of folks um, being considered second-class citizens, uh, those whose very identities and lives are out of bounds just because of the way they are, the way they exist, the way they look, uh, their gender, their their sex, their 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 race, uh, their religion, and so on. For me, there's a, a reason that the founders of this country were so intent on building a democracy, and it's because they had experienced what it was like to come from a continent that had been absolutely ravaged by not only religious war, but by uh, wars between princes and authoritarians. So I understand the question, but I am not somebody who has concluded that we should move away from democracy because um, there are folks in our democracy who we think are misinformed or, um, or ill-informed or not informed at all. I think I'd rather work toward a system where we're doing our best with our neighbors, with our friends, with our colleagues to say, hey, here's what's at stake. Here's some really basic principles. I want you to live in a country where whoever you are, you're free. You can be secular, you can be humanist, you can be a Jew, you can be a Muslim, you can be a Christian. You do your life. I want you to have the freedom of conscience. I don't want you to be afraid that if you uh, don't believe a certain way or uh, you know have a certain uh, mode of living that you're going to end up in jail or end up with a you know a, a second class life. Um, so that's not easy. I, I'm not saying that that's something we can solve over lunch. We can't, but I am here to say I'm fighting for that. And I believe in that much more than I believe in anybody. And I, I hate to say it, y'all, y'all look like a nice group, but I'm not going to give any of you power over me. I'm not going to say, Hey, you believe the you be the benevolent dictator. I'm not even going to give you 10 of you power over me. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to say, you know, Jeff and Dave and, and Pam and, and Sharon, they're nice folks. You all be the oligarchy and you get in there and you make the decisions. Um, it's just not not something I'm ever going to think is going to end up well. Um, democracy is about sharing power. It invests power in every person. That's good because it means that we don't have one or a few taking over the many. It's hard because everybody gets a voice, even the folks that sometimes we think are not informed are not prone to making good decisions or with whom we fundamentally disagree. So that's kind of where I come down on that. Uh, when it comes to a Christian prince, I agree. Mitt Romney, if I were making a Disney character, he has the hair to be a prince. It's just, it looks good. It's good hair, okay? Um, he's the one I'm going to put in that role. But um, you, you said something there that I think is really important. You said, I would not make Donald Trump the prince because he's such a bad person. The people who think of Donald Trump as an ideal leader or dictator do not think of him as a bad person, period. They don't. They don't see him in that way. I think that's where we have to start. I think number two, um, Donald Trump may not be the ideal prince 
if you ask Stephen Wolf, the guy who wrote that book, he may say, yeah, he's not my first pick, but I, I will take him over anyone else. You know why? And and this is, this is I think, really important. We had a Christian pa uh, Christian president in George W. Bush, right? You, you know, George W. Bush, the evangelical, everyone remembers. Jesus saved me from alcoholism. He talked about this all the time. And if you're a Christian nationalist, you know what happened during George Trump's uh, George W. Bush's presidency? Yes, Patriot Act and and all of the things that happened after 9-11 might, might be a fan of what he did in Iraq and Afghanistan. But like all the way up to 2006, 7, 8, there was like more gay people everywhere. There was like more, more immigrants everywhere, less Christians. It just, he didn't like bully the country into like submission enough. And then what happened? Barack Obama. He's like created in a lab to scare you if you're a Christian nationalist. It's like they created a video game character to like frighten you if you're a white Christian nationalist, right? He's he's dad's from another country. He's mixed race. His wife's black. His kids are black. His name's Barack. His name's Hussein. He grew up in Hawaii. Is that even a part of the country? Do you have to change your money if you go to Hawaii? I don't I can't remember. Okay. So he becomes president and all of a sudden. It's like people, they think the country's lost its mind and now gay people can get married. You know what? Enough. I want a guy in charge who's a bully. I want a barbarian. I want a brutalizer. I want somebody who will put all those folks I just talked about in place. I don't want a Christian president. I want somebody who's going to create a Christian country. So yeah, he might sleep with porn stars and he might be divorced and blah, great. Get out there and hurt the people I want hurt. And I'll call you my Christian president. That's how they feel. So he may not read the Bible. He may not go to church. I mean, Joe Biden goes to mass like six or seven times a day, right? Y'all y'all, y'all know that, I mean, right? Donald Trump may not be a Christian in that sense, but he's going to hurt the people I want to hurt and therefore create the Christian order in this society. And then that's what I need. He's my man. So I think that's how they get there with him. Oh, Brad, thanks so much for your work and for your presentation today. You mentioned violence just a moment ago. Um, who do you think, or what do you think will be the targets of that violence? How will that play out? Yeah, great question. Thank you. I, so I, I think we're already seeing that violence um, in, in many ways. Um, I think we're seeing situations across the country where, um, you know, if you are, uh, and I will say just personally, right? I live in California. I live in, I live in the Bay Area. This is the place in the country where there are more Asian people per capita than anywhere else. I live near one of the three remaining Japan towns in the country. And during the pandemic, there, we had to have a patrol walking around so that the elders in our community, the senior citizens, were not attacked by people saying, go back to China. Okay. So we already have little fires everywhere, right? You may not see it when you walk down the street, but if you are a person of color, if you're gay, if you're a trans person, you are living in fear in this, in this America now. Um, that will only get worse. So Trump has said on day one, he wants to institute the Insurrection Act. He's also, by way of his um, his uh, 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 administrator, uh, Stephen Miller, said that they want to create something like what Dwight Eisenhower did and put hundreds of thousands of people in camps who are suspected of being undocumented and then flying them back to where, where their country of origin. So... To me, you can say, all right, that's the government doing that. But what happens when the government gives you permission to openly persecute those folks, whether those are folks who are brown, whether those are folks who are speaking Spanish at Walmart, whether those are folks who are um, what you take to be, you know, a gay person walking into your grocery store. What happens downstream when the government and the leaders you respect to give you that permission is you act on it, right? You start to say, well, yeah, get get this person who I suspect to be what? A gay person, somebody who speaks Spanish at home. I'm going to walk up to them while they're trying to eat their pizza at lunch and tell them to go back to their country. I'm going to approach that person of Asian descent and say, why did you bring the coronavirus here? Right. So 
that violence, I think, is is already something a lot of people live with, but the permission structure will be expanded, okay? And so I, I'll just say, uh, you know, my 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 dad's, I'm Onishi, my dad's uh, of Japanese descent. My family goes back to Hawaii and then to Japan a couple hundred years. When you think about Japanese internment, um, I think of like, you know, I think of my grandfather. He signed up to to fight for the United States and he he was part of a code breaking unit that trained in San Francisco, but they eventually had to move their headquarters to rural Minnesota, Camp Savage in Minnesota. Some of you might know that because when those guys walked down the street, um, they were yelled at, attacked, and uh, violence was, was put upon them at every turn. And it's because the messages coming from all corners, whether it was pastors or FDR or anywhere else, were Japanese of any kind are the enemy you know, they are out of bounds. So my grandfather who signed up to fight for this country and is training to do it has to leave us where he's at and go to rural Minnesota where nobody would see him in order to uh, actually uh, carry out his military training. So I think that's the kind of violence we're going to see on an everyday basis. We're already seeing it in this country. There are little fires everywhere, whether that is at uh, Drag Queen Story Hour, whether that is gay folks trying to have brunch, whether that is... Um, anything in between. So um not sure if that answers your question, but um, I, I hope it, it gives at least a snapshot. Um, I, I was just wondering if we were gonna have access to this PowerPoint when this is. Sure, I can send it. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of the effect on the election will be from uh, foreign problems like Ukraine and Gaza, Israel. Can you say the first part again? What what about the election? The What will be the effect of Gaza, Israel, Ukraine on the election? How will that affect people who want to be authoritarians? Yeah. <laughs> I think we can see already what will happen with Ukraine and Russia. Um, <clears throat> Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, I could... I can give you three hours on Mike Johnson. I know you all don't want that. Um, but Mike Johnson is a Christian nationalist of the most hardcore stripes. He has held up uh, funding and aid to Ukraine here for the last month or so. And I've already outlined that a lot of the Christian nationalists that I'm thinking of and who are part of uh, Trump's orbit and will be part of his Trump administration, they see Putin as an ally and they see uh, the conflict in Ukraine is something that Putin should be able to do if he wants. They see a worldview of nationalists. They see a worldview of isolationism. They see a worldview of anti-interventionism. And thus, uh, when it comes to Ukraine, the United States will abandon Ukraine and then effectively abandon NATO. That is my prediction. Um, there will be more threats to leave NATO. And if we abandon Ukraine, there will be effectively among our allies in Europe a sense that we have we have abandoned NATO. How could they trust us to step in again if we won't step in now uh, when it comes to Ukraine? Because the, whether it's um, whether it's folks in Scandinavia, whether it's folks in Germany, whether it's folks in Poland, they're looking around and thinking, why would we ever think you're our ally if you're not willing to help here? Now, on the other hand, when it comes to Israel, uh, Palestine, Gaza. Uh, there is a clear sense that uh, from Christian nationalists and and from Trump himself, there's a track record of this, that Israel should be uh, protected and helped at all costs. There are theological reasons for that. There are ideological reasons for that. I could give you another three hours about how Christian nationalists fetishize Israel, even though many of them do not love or care about actual Jewish people. Right There's a sense in which Israel is held up on a pedestal as playing a certain role in God's history, and yet Jewish people are seen often as strangers, others, um, and uh, foreigners in their midst. So there will be a unilateral uh, move to support Israel, and there will be a unilateral view of uh, Palestinians um, as the enemy. Um, they will be seen as, as someone who is anti-United States in every sense, no matter what. Uh, this is, of course, a very um, delicate topic, and I don't think we have time to get into all the ins and outs, but I can tell you that if Trump is elected, um, there will be no sense of there being uh, human beings on both sides who need to be understood as perhaps starving, homeless, under threat of bombing, 
none of that will be coming into play. It will simply be Hamas is the enemy. Hamas is uh, is with Iran. Iran is our is our enemy, so on and so forth. Therefore, no sympathy, no aid, no understanding for anyone who might be in Gaza. Um, full stop. And if you're in this country and you are Muslim, you are Palestinian, you are also seen as a domestic threat and foreigner and other, and you better keep your head down and be quiet. Otherwise, uh, you will be a target yourself. Um, I have an apocalypse question. So <laughs> I have people in my orbit who talk about climate change and talk about AI yeah. and that as sapiens, we're, um, we're not capable of doing anything beyond our own self-interest and, um, and can't really look too far ahead in the future. And that democracy is too slow and um, if there was a person or 10 people out there that could be smarter than us and maybe would have to tell us how to live our lives to stop climate change, maybe there is another system. I don't think it has anything to do with Christians. Um, if there's another system that could, could maybe salvage uh, the world in the next 80 years, I, I, I would... You know, I, I would like to see something, some some pe smart people get their heads together and, and try to figure out, or maybe it's just hopeless. I kind of think it's hopeless. I, I think we're doomed, but I'm wondering, I'm curious about the apocalypse. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think there's a couple dimensions to your, your your comment there. I think one of them is, hey, you just said that these folks believe in apocalypse. Does that mean that um, fear of climate apocalypse is unjustified, right? Is Does that mean that any apocalypse warning is fear-mongering? And my answer is no. My answer is I think about climate change all the time. I have two little kids, and I think about what is their what is their world like when I'm when they're my age. my My argument would be that fear of climate change and climate crisis, climate catastrophe, which is already happening, is based on data and evidence. That's that's why I believe in it. So if you if you hold up this, hey, here's the ways that humans have affected climate change and the ways that our world is changing in terms of its climate and so on. Here's the data. Okay, great. Joe Biden's a Marxist. He's going to destroy your country. I don't know everyone's politics in the country in the room right now. I will tell you, when I think of the history of Marxism, it rarely goes from Karl Marx to Trotsky to Lenin to Joe Biden. Like there's no, I mean, Joe Biden's been in the Senate since like 1924. Okay. He's been a centrist the whole time. There's no sense that Joe Biden is a Marxist. Like when you say that and you say that he's, he's a radical, I look at 50 years of data of him as a politician and I'm like, you're wrong. So why do I believe in one apocalypse and not the other data and evidence, right? Critical thinking. So that's, that's one. If your friends want to have that debate, I understand the temptation to anti-democratic climate action. I get it. I understand it. I understand. I have I have laid awake at night and thought myself, would it be possible if a few people just got in charge and said, we got to do it this way to save save our, our, our climate? And I get it. The reason I'm not willing, and, and this is the same reasoning uh, in terms of the first question today, to go down that road is because I don't, those quote unquote smart people you're talking about. Five years ago, somebody was said Elon Musk for president. And I live about, I live about 20 miles from Elon Musk. I, I, I want nothing to do with that man making any decisions on hum, about human lives. Right. I mean, none. I mean, and I don't know if you followed Elon Musk recently or what he tweets and what he talks about, but the idea that he is the smart guy that would be part of the oligarchy, the 10, the 10 elders that would, you know, decide the fate of, of humanity. No, thank you. Uh, ben Carson. I mean, Ben Carson is one of the most accomplished and revolutionary surgeons of our lifetime. If he had ever just stayed out of politics, we might all be thinking of Ben Carson as one of our heroes, right? Some of you might be. And yet he got into politics and good Lord, he does not look like a genius to me, right? I think all of us know how this works. 
some of us are really good at certain things and some of us are not. And so the idea that we would pick the 10 smart people, I just keep coming back to like, who gets to pick? What does it mean to be smart? What does it mean to be wise? What does it mean to be fit for that job? Because there's folks that would be held up like Elon Musk that I just think this would be disastrous for so many. And so I understand the impulse. I'm not, I don't disagree. I have my moments of despair. I get it. Despair is not a strategy. And every time I look at those little kids that, that uh, are in my house, I know I can't choose that. So I got to choose something else, right? I could, I can spend all day staring into the abyss or not. And I'm just going to choose the second one. Um, doesn't mean I think we're going to win. Doesn't mean I think there's a chance to avoid, you know, what will be widespread climate like apocalypse. It just means I can't choose that if I'm going to exist here and do my best for the people I care about. American populace, you said, needs more information. Okay, how are we going to deal with the disastrous effects of AI on information? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, so I, I'm not sure that the one thing I'll say is I'm not sure the American public needs more information. I think it needs um, information that is not designed to uh, be misleading. So I, I, I think that's one. Um, AI is a whole is a whole thing that is happening right in front of us that uh, will change everything. Um, and it already has. I'm not going to sit up here on this Sunday morning and, and pretend that I know I don't. I, I have not, I, I just I just don't have an answer to that, even though I have complete sympathy uh, with the fear. And I, I realize myself that we're just in a different place, not from 50 years ago, we're in a different place than 18 months ago. We just are. And in terms of what images are real, what videos are real, the ways decisions are made, the way we work, the way we play, um, we're going to be in a different place a year from now. And we're definitely going to be in a different place 10 years from now. Like it is all just going to change. And um, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be sophomoric and I'm not going to be mis, misguided and say, I, I know something about that, that you don't, but it is something that, especially as somebody who teaches writing and, and thinking for a living, what does that even look like in five years? I, I have no idea. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick question. All of us in the room today, I safe to say most of us are probably over 60 years old. We're, you know, in a time of our life where we have lots of energy and lots of experience and time to read books and think about these things and door knock. And I have a 26 and a 24 year old who are saying, mom, I got to vote for somebody I believe in and I can't vote for somebody I don't believe in. And I've been struggling over that for many decades with one short interlude where I was euphoric <laughs> uh, a couple of presidents a couple of presidencies ago, or well, with, yeah. with, obviously with, with Obama. But what do we do with the young people? And do you have any ideas for helping us to try to 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 get people on board? I think we just need to get more people to vote this time, or we cannot change people's minds who are already on board the the yep. Trump vote. So yep. it's no, it's a numbers game, isn't it? Yep. So I think, um, I think let's just be honest. If you, if you, I didn't catch your name, I apologize. Um, but if, if you have children, you have people in your life who are 18, 25, 35, I'm going to be really honest. Most of them do not have any enthusiasm for Joe Biden. They just don't. And they are in a place where they see what's happening in, in Gaza and they're turned off. They see what's happening um, with other issues related, especially to climate, and they're turned off. And they're like, just as you said, I don't believe in this. Why would I vote for more of this? And I, my response would not be, well, you know, my response would be like, first, I understand. I understand. I get it. And I, I also get that you are 25 and I am you know, I'm 43, some of you are 53, 63, some of you are 73. I understand you're looking toward a, 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 another 50 years of a system that you feel like is, is not working. I understand. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to try to tell you you're wrong. I'm not. 
The only thing I'm going to tell you is that there's a choice here to do th two things. One is to vote for the very possibility of having a system at all. We may not have one if Project 2025 and um, there's already calls for Trump 2028. Uh, the, the the American conservative just published an essay for Trump 2028. I guarantee you that if he's elected within six months of his next term, Trump 2028 will be something you hear on Fox News, Newsmax, and in other places all the time. So you can vote for the possibility of having a system. That's when, and they may look at you like, all right, no, not, you're still not doing it for me. So I'll just, I'll just say this. I, I think if you're talking to that 25 year old, um, I would say, okay, Let's not talk about Joe Biden, but do you believe in re reproductive rights? Is that something that's important to you? Because I can tell you as somebody who studies these things every day, the goal is not just to make sure that Roe v. Wade is, is something that stays overturned. The goal is to make sure that uh, contraception is not, is not something that's available to everybody. Um, some of you in the room may be thinking, it's not something I think about or care about every day, but I can tell you the 25-year-olds are. Can tell you the 25 year old women are contraception something that is important for you to have uh is is birth control these are things they would like to take away period i can tell you that as somebody who who, who tries to stay abreast of these things on a daily basis you may not like joe biden's uh track record on climate and i get it but the other the other choice is to elect somebody who is telling you he wants to gut the epa period so you can not vote, you can vote for a third party because you don't feel it right now. Or you can look at the two choices you have as a 25 year old and say, not, neither of them are ones I love. But one of them is catastrophic. One of them may be the end of democracy. And the other is one that I'll have to live with. The final thing I'll say is, who does life get really bad for if Trump is elected? It may not be you, 25 year old, because you may be white or straight. I'll just be really honest. But there's a lot of folks in this country who are who are really sure that if Trump's elected a second time, they are gonna have to be afraid every moment of every day. Afraid of camp, afraid of violence, afraid of persecution, afraid of having their kids taken away because they wanted to give their kids uh, gender affirming care. Afraid of um, all kinds of things. So you may not be affected, you may be thinking, hey, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in Joe Biden. I'm not voting for him. And I might say, well, who who gets hurt? And and there, there's going to be a long discussion. This is not a, a 10 second discussion. This is a three hour coffee discussion. Because they're going to say a lot of people are getting hurt right now. And I'm going to say, you're right. But to me, it's not a matter of voting for someone you're in love with. It's a matter of voting for things you care about and people you care about. It's a it's a it's a choice of two bad decisions. And I'll just I'll just be really blunt because I know we're gonna sign off here soon. There's folks in this world who are not used to having bad decisions. Right? That's privilege. There's folks in the world who've never had to look at look at life and say, well, I got to choose between one one thing I don't like or one thing that's even worse. Right? They're used to saying, I, I want to choose the thing that's good or not, and not the thing that's bad. But a lot of other people in this world are really used to say are used to facing circumstances of it's either worse or not as bad. And I'm going to work to make a, a world where I don't have to make that choice. But until that world exists, I'm going to make the choice of the thing that is less bad rather than the one that might be catastrophic. So that's how I would talk to the young people. Climate, reproductive rights. Um, and who gets hurt even more if, if a second Trump term happens?